Welcome to this talk on atypical cartilaginous neoplasm terminology, clinical pathologic controversy, and consensus, conjointly done by myself and Dr. Fabri at the Department of Surgery Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. I will start first, and the first talk will be uh, on the atypical cartilaginous tumor terminology. And I hope that you're entertained uh, during uh, this talk. So I'll start it by telling you a story from the automobile industry about the BMW X6. The BMW X6 was supposed to be an evolution of the BMW X5. Uh, it was a concept by BMW which was going to create a coupe-like SUV. Instead of having a boxy uh, rear end, they created more of a, a coupe hatch style rear end. And at the time, one of the journalists responded by saying it was the answer to the question nobody asked. So I'm not sure atypical cartilaginous tumor has actually improved our ability to separate in chondroma and chondrosarcoma, as some have hoped. Uh, and I don't know that it is, it is a better application of the terminology of grade one chondrosarcoma to the long bones and digits, but it is what the WHO has recommended. And it's of course my job to actually introduce uh, this audience to this co concept if you're not already familiar with it. So let's talk about the background of the term atypical cartilaginous tumor. It was first introduced in the 2013 fourth edition of the WHO as essentially being synonymous with grade one chondrosarcomas. And of course, this was referring to locally aggressive lesions uh, that only metastasized in exceptional cases and when found in the long bones could be treated with curatage and local adjuvants. There was even one note that said, quote, the distinction between it and enchondroma can be difficult and has a high inner server variability. And of course, we already knew that. Now, fast forward 2020, fifth edition of the WHO, and we have an expansion on the distinction of acting grade one chondrosarcoma specifically related to anatomic site. Tumors in the appendicular skeleton along the short tumor bones were now going to be called ACTs, while tumors in the axial skeleton, flat bones, pelvis, scapula, and skull base would remain as grade one chondrosarcoma. So it was anatomic location that was going to determine whether you use the term ACT or grade one chondrosarcomas. And this, of course, was meant to better reflect the improved outcome in appendicular lesions versus those in the axial skeleton. And of course, there is precedent and literature support for this terminology. Uh, we know, and this is one of several articles that attempted to address this, uh, we know that this article from the Mayo Clinic, uh, which did show a better outcome among grade one appendicular skeletal chondrosarcomas. And in fact, they looked at two subsets uh, of patients, one who were treated with intralesional curatage and one uh, portion who uh, were treated uh, with wide resection and they found no difference in outcome. There were only two cases that metastasized. One of those uh, de differentiated and the other one progressed to a higher grade. And of course, this does support the fact uh, that long bone grade one chondrosarcomas tend to behave better than those in the axial skeleton and can be treated more conservatively. I also suspect that, that there were similarities drawn between atypical lipomatous tumor, well-differentiated liposarcoma soft tissues, we'll call ALTWDL, and ACTs, grade one chondrosarcomas within bone. And you can see this table, there are some definite overlapping similarities. Both tumors can de-differentiate, but there are also some significant differences that we're going to talk about in more detail. Uh, first of all, ALTs, WDL, soft tissue never metastasize, but that's not true of, of ACTs, grade one chondrosarcomas, which may rarely metastasize. But I think there was an attempt to unify the terminology here. So problems with the term atypical cartilaginous tumor we're going to elaborate on. First of all, what you call ACT is inherently linked to what you would call grade one chondrosarcoma, but it's in a different anatomic location, correct? And so for it to be accurate means it needs to be applied to a relatively objective uh, and easily reproducible histologic grade system. And unfortunately, we don't have that in chondrosarcomas, and we'll talk about that momentarily. Also, uh, when we talk about 
the distinction between enchondroma and chondrosarcoma, we know that the threshold for malignancy varies based on a whole host of factors. For example, anatomic location, we'll talk more about that shortly. That's also very different than what we encounter with atypical like pulmonary tumor. And one of the problems it created for those of us who routinely do, uh, uh, who routinely examine uh, sarcoma specimens from the skeleton is it took away a term that we were using, uh, some of us were using to describe tumors that we didn't know what they were. Uh, so far less than 5% of cases I've encountered in my career, I've not been able to at least put in a category of enchondroma grade one chondrosarcomas, and those I would call atypical cartilaginous lesion, atypical cartilaginous tumor. And now I'm faced with the dilemma of what will be the term that I use to uh, designate those tumors appropriately. Um, so let's start first with histologic grading. We know that histologic grading is a significant predictor of local recurrence and metastases, and this has been supported by a number of articles. Unfortunately, when I try to show you how we grade these, I don't really have any good quantifiable criteria. Chondrosarcomas just aren't that mitotically active, for example, so if you see a mitosis, it's probably at least grade two, but it doesn't really help you with the dilemma of grade one versus in chondroma. We just don't see them enough. The system that I use is, real, is from the Mayo Clinic and is predominantly uses cellularity as the main criteria, uh, followed by atypia. It's a three-tiered system. Uh, the other problem with chondrosarcomas is that they can, we can see higher grades in other fields, for example, within the same tumor, and tumors can recur. Uh, as a higher grade tumor uh, than they started. They don't have to de-differentiate to become a higher grade tumor. Um, this article from the Mayo Clinic in Cancer in 1998 also gives you an idea of the breakdown of tumors within the Mayo Clinic system using this grading system. And this is largely mirrors my own experience at applying their grading system. I see a lot of grade one tumors. Uh, I see a fair number of grade two and I see virtually no grade three. Now, uh, not surprisingly, if you look at grade one chondrosarcoma among various institutions, you see part of the problem. Um, we, we have a, a wide range between, and I just randomly chose these MD Anderson Mayo Clinic, Rizzoli University of Florida as examples, but I don't think when you look at the Rizzoli's experience that they're seeing that their distribution of chondrosarcomas in their population is only is half of that at Mayo Clinic. I, my gut impression is this is a problem with histologic grading, not a difference in their patient population. Of course, this influences uh, how uh, you, you know, the number of patients who would uh, die from their disease and the percentage of metastases. So it's not uniform and that's reflected in the, in the problems you see here. Now, just for completeness sake, let me just show you a little bit about how I grade because like I said, how you grade, where you apply your criteria for grade one also is where you would designate uh, atypical cartilaginous tumor designation. And when I look over here on the left at grade one, I see a cartilaginous permeative tumor, it's trap bone. The cellularity is really not that appreciably different from what we would expect with an enchondroma of the long bones. But as we move to intermediate grade, grade two chondrosarcoma, we see an increased amount of cellularity a corresponding increase in the amount of atypia. Now it's not marked. If it's marked, we, kind of, we tend to expect a chondroblastic osteosarcoma and we still see evidence of hyaline cartilage differentiation. As we get into the grade three arena, we see a highly cellular tumor with some spindling tendencies, not much in the way of really definite hyaline cartilage differentiation. In fact, it looks more mixoid. So in the Mayo Clinic and, and system, basically cellularity increases with increasing grade, uh, hyaline cartilage differentiation decreases with increasing grade, and you begin to see an increasing amount of mixoid change. But again, you can see the problem I'm talking about, where you draw the line between grade one and grade two is necessarily going to indicate where, you know, what your definition of atypical cartilaginous tumor would be. Now, diagnosing hyaline cartilage lesions of the skeleton also needs to be discussed because the threshold for malignancy does vary based on a host of factors. This is not true at all of atypical lipomatous tumor, for example. Anatomic location matters. The threshold for what we call malignant or what we would call aggressive radiologically is different for lesions that are in the digits versus those in the long bone. Similarly, periosteal cartilaginous lesions can have cellularity such that if that same lesion were an intramedullary cartilage, 
cartilaginous tumor, we would call it malignant. Patients with multiple enchondromatosis, for example, produce highly cellular and often atypical lesions that outside of that context would be considered malignant. Uh, patients with enchondromas of the long bones often are found incidentally. They have no pain, whereas patients with, with enchondromas of the digits almost always have pain. So bottom line is criteria and threshold for diagnosis change based on the anatomic, location, or clinical circumstances. That isn't true of a typical lipomatous tumor, and this can pose problems for where we designate a typical uh, cartilaginous tumors. Uh, in general. Just to show you examples of enchondromas in the digits, and these are three separate enchondromas, two of which involve the phalanges, one of which, which involves the metacarpals, and you see right away the problem. All these patients would have had pain. They have lytic lesions. There's cortical erosion. There's even expansion of the bone over here on the, on the right side. So it kind of, uh, so basically location matters. The threshold for calling malignant is higher in the digits than it is in the long bones. Similarly, when we look at the pathology of digital enchondromas, the same problem exists. Lesions are typically more cellular. Uh, the same lesions that are in the long bones would be called chondrosarcomas, and in some cases, grade two. So you have to know the clinical and radiologic features to properly interpret and properly diagnose cartilaginous lesions. So how do we make, I mean, if for completeness sake, how do we distinguish enchondroma for low-grade chondrosarcoma? Well, there's some things that can help, but by far and away, the most important criteria and the most reliable criteria is actually soft tissue extension. And I put the reference down here, but I want to make a point of, of, of showing that in this study, they had 44 grade one tumors and four of these metastasized. And if you look at the location of the METs here, uh, the, you know, the majority were in these larger bones in the foot, but they did have one each in the metacarpal, metatarsal, and phalanx that actually metastasize. So grade one tumors do metastasize, and very rarely tumors in the phalanx can as well. Just to show you the radiographic features of what we would call an atypical cartilaginous tumor slash grade one chondrosarcoma of the digits, this is it right here. It has evidence of soft tissue extension outside of the bone, and this is illustrated in this pathology uh, picture as well. Oliase disease, even worse of a problem, I think. So in Oliase disease, we have a, uh, a multiple enchondromatosis uh, type setting. Uh, where you can have enchondromas produced in periosteum, uh, in intracortical locations, and intramedullary. Uh, and they are quite cellular. They can show a significant amount of myxoid change, and they can also be quite atypical. So it'd be very hard to distinguish these lesions. And outside of this context, uh, one would most certainly call this chondrosarcoma. Risk is relatively high in these, but if you look at uh, what it takes to make the diagnosis of malignancy, it takes cortical destruction and soft tissue extension, and usually this is in a patient who will complain of recent growth and pain in an, an, an affected type area. So what are my concluding remarks and recommendations regarding the atypical cartilaginous tumor uh, terminology? Well, first of all, just know that where you apply this is going to be somewhat subjective because we have a, a relatively subjective grading system. What you consider grade one is also going to be your threshold for ACT. And of course, the threshold for establishing a diagnosis of malignancy is variable depending on anatomic site. So what you may call ACT in one location may be an enchondroma in another location. Remember that the terminology is supposed to apply to a fully malignant tumor. And we're going to get back to that in a moment. That means one of two things. That means you can line diagnose these as ACT slash grade one chondrosarcoma, uh, because basically we're talking about the same thing. Or you can do what I'm doing now that I used to do with a lot of ALTs. And that is, if I use that term, I will put a comment that says ACT is considered synonymous with the designation grade one chondrosarcoma. And it refers to a lesion that may locally recur but in the absence of dedifferentiation, is highly unlikely to metastasize. Very important. I used to say won't metastasize for ALTs, but in this certain circumstance, I say highly unlikely. And of course, the WHO recommends that ACT be the designation that we use for uh, essentially grade one chondrosarcomas involving long bone and small tubular bones of the digits. I actually believe it's really ideal uh, for the latter location. And maybe the most important point of all, ACT should never be used as a uh, designation of uncertainty, right? 
it is it is not a meant to be uh, used for when we don't know what the lesion is. That distinction between enchondroma and low-grade chondrosarcoma remains very important. So ACT is, is not to be used when we're uncertain. It is a full, it is a designation of a fully malignant tumor analogous with grade one chondrosarcoma and it's used to reflect a better outcome in certain locations. Thank you and I hope this has been an entertaining uh, tale of, of the terminology of atypical cartilaginous tumor in grade one chondrosarcoma.